Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to part one of using the Power Platform to extend finance and operation apps, use cases and recommended practices. My name is Ross and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. By participating in this session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number, and or title may be viewable by other session participants. If you do not consent to being part of a recorded session, please disconnect at this time. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located at the right side of your screen. Moderators are standing by to answer your questions throughout today's presentation. We will also have time at the end of, for further questions. To turn on closed captioning, click on the CC button on the lower left side of your screen. To change languages, click on the gear icon and choose your preference. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Rachel Profit, Senior Program Manager. Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Ross. I'm so excited to have uh, the opportunity to present to all of you today. Thank you for joining whatever time of day it might be for you. I also have joining uh, with me today a great group. I've been referring to them as my dream team of presenters. Uh, I have Jason Green. He is a senior program manager in Power Apps. We have Chris Gardy, who is a senior program manager for Power Automate. Uh, we also have Morali Kumandari, who is a senior program manager for FNO Solutions Architecture. We have Sunil Garg, who is a principal program manager with the Common Data Service. And we also have Vasavi Bav Baviri Seti, who is a senior program manager with the Power Platform Customer Success Team. So we've got a great lineup of people available here to help answer questions and who will be presenting along the way. For those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Rachel Profit. Um, I've got my contact information up here on the screen. Feel free to reach out with, to me with any questions or suggestions that you might have for this exciting series that we've got started. You can reach me on Twitter at Rachel Profit or find me on LinkedIn. And you can also follow my blog at dynamics365lady.com. So taking a look at what we're gonna talk about today, um, we have compiled uh, 90 plus examples to share. Um, and these use cases and scenarios are not a, a full list of what you could do. We're just hoping that these use cases and scenarios will help get you excited and get you started on your own journey with extending finance and operations by using the Common Data Service, Power Automate, Power Apps, Power Virtual Agents, and more. Towards the end of the session, we're gonna finish off with a look at the application lifecycle management story for the Plower platform. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right in and start taking a look. We're gonna get started today by talking about the Common Data Service. So I like to think of the Common Data Service as the heart of the Power Platform. And when you start with the Common Data Service, I like to think that the rest of the platform will just kind of fall into place, so to speak. We're gonna to touch on dual right, virtual entities, data integrator and industry accelerators. So starting out with dual right, dual right has been um, available for you know some time now. And for those of you who are not familiar with the dual right framework, it's built in FNO and designed to work with the common data service. It provides near real time bi-directional integration between finance and operations and the common data service. You can use it with your human resources application as well if you deploy the uh, human resources application on the same CDS as your customer engagement apps, or if you connect your uh, FNO environment dual right directly to the same CDS where your human resources environment is deployed. Um, you will want to use the dual right framework in scenarios where the data is needed in the CDS or possibly in another external application. Um, it's important to note that when you use dual right, it is duplicating that data into um, the, the database behind that common data service. Um, it's important to note that there are some differences in behavior of the common data service when you install and use the dual right framework, um, such as the money data type, the data effectivity, currency, and unit conversion behaviors. The platform comes with a variety of tools to help you manage the mapping, errors, alerts, and a variety of other things. 
We've compiled a variety of learning resources that will um, help you get started on your journey, and you'll find those on the links in the bottom of all of the slides throughout this presentation. We've also prepared an appendix of additional resources above and beyond the resources and links that you'll find at the bottom of the page here. So next up is the virtual entities. Virtual entities are a new feature that um, was just released as a part of 10.0.12 with uh, PU 36. Um, and there are a lot of benefits and reasons why um, you'll want to use virtual entities. I like to think of these virtual entities as a game changer. Um, and I've been super excited about this feature coming. So um, with the new virtual entities feature, it exposes all of your public data entities entities and all of your FNO data into the common data service. Um, there are a number of ways that you might use these virtual entities um, once that data is available in the CDS. One thing that's important to note about these virtual entities is that it does not actually copy the data, so we're not duplicating uh, the data into the CDS. We're just making it available through the Power Platform. So a few examples of how customer engagement users uh, might be able to leverage virtual entities um, here are viewing credit information. So instead of synchronizing data um, over to the common data service, we could create and extend um, the sales app, for example, or the customer service app to include additional information about accounts such as credit limits, collection letters, and so on. Another example is you might want to display product or inventory on hand information um, in the customer engagement side of uh, the application. You, if you're using field service um, and you've also got asset management installed, you could view some of that asset managed asset maintenance information or fixed asset details right inside of field service. If you're an FNO user, some examples of uh, ways that you might use virtual entities include creating a power app to make uh, data entry more simplified. So if there's a screen inside of FNO that is maybe too complex and you want to simplify something, or maybe you need the ability to, to scan a barcode or take pictures as a part of a particular process, Power Apps gives us great experiences to make it very easy with a dra drag and drop experience so that you don't need to have a developer to make these um, advanced experiences in the user interface and you can make simplified experiences for your user. Another example is triggering a Power Automate flow for emails or automation. Now it's important to note with the virtual entities that currently there are no triggers um, that uh, if you were to um, virtual entities don't have change tracking. So I can't uh, trigger off of a virtual entity when a record is created or updated and so on. We do have a new feature on the roadmap that's coming soon to surface business events into the common data service, but we would still be able to use existing business events that we have inside of FNO and then leverage those virtual entities to pull the data um, in scenarios where you might need to send an email or perform other automation with the 300 plus connectors that we have. So switching gears a little bit to the data integrator. So the data integrator has been around for a while. Uh, there are a variety of templates that you can use to move data into or out of the common data service. One thing that's important to note about the uh, data integrator is that it is a one directional integration tool that is asynchronous. So you run it on a batch process, much like we run batch jobs inside of finance and operations. You can set the frequency for each um, project of how often you want that to run. Um, there are also connectors with Data Integrator for other apps like Salesforce and SAP, for example, if you have integration scenarios with other applications. So this can be really powerful and useful in scenarios where um, you need to connect another application uh, by using the, the common data service. Um, 
With the prospect to cache and field service integration, which are the two of the examples of the templates that I've put up here, um, you can quickly and easily start integrating your customer engagement data with your finance and operations data. So it's quite flexible and there's a lot of templates, um, kind of what's listed out here are the um, entities and the direction of that mapping. So for example, sales and CE map over to F and O, but products from F and O go into CE. So again, remembering that it's one directional, which is a big difference between the dual right functionality. Again, you'll find some more links down here at the bottom to get um, to help you get started on your journey with using the data integrator. Now switching gears to industry accelerators, um, we've released nine different industry accelerators. One thing that's important to note about these industry accelerators is currently there are no out of the box integrations with FNO. Um, it doesn't mean that you cannot leverage or use or get a lot of value out of these accelerators though. If you are an organization or you're implementing as a partner for an organization that is in one of these nine industries, and I have slides to talk about them all, it's um, important to note that you can leverage these accelerators to make it easier to develop your solutions quickly. So each of the accelerators includes a different package of um, inside of the solution, and I've kind of outlined at a very high level what's included, and I've included links at the bottom where you can learn more about exactly what's inside of each one of these. So taking a look first at the automotive um, accelerator, it includes entities like deals, fleets, warranties, and test drives. Um, inside of the package and the solution, when you install it, it includes the data model that includes all of those entities and many more, plus some Power BI dashboards, a Canvas app, and some model-driven app samples. If you use the banking industry accelerator, it includes entities like banks, branches, loans, and financial products. Um, the data model is also included there along with some sample apps and dashboards. One of the great or unique things about the insurance accelerator is that it is designed and integrates directly with Dynamics 365 sales. Um, it includes a variety of entities again, and it can be used for both producer and agency management. Um, the data model, sample apps, and dashboards again are included. The next three accelerators that we have are the healthcare, higher education, and K through 12. So with the healthcare accelerator, we include entities like patient, practitioner, and related persons. Um, the data model is included along with a variety of sample apps and dashboards. With higher education in K through 12, these are two great examples that are leveraging the Power Apps portals functionality. So uh, the higher education includes a student portal and the K through 12 includes two portals, one for parents and one for students. Uh, both include the data model as well as sample apps and dashboards. Uh, the entities are very similar, but there are some differences. So in higher education, you'll find things like internships, scholarships, grants, and accomplishments, while K through 12 includes additional entities uh, for educators, donors, behavior management, and attendance management. The last three industry accelerators I want to talk about are nonprofit, manufacturing, and media and communications. The nonprofit accelerator includes entities like um, constituent management, fundraising, awards, program delivery, and impact tracking. The data model includes um, a variety of entities along with eight model-driven apps to help manage different aspects of a nonprofit organization. Along with that included our dashboards and some data integrator templates. For the manufacturing accelerator, it includes entities like supplier onboarding, API onboarding, and supplier management consoles. Uh, the data model includes um, a lot of additional entities and there is a sample portal available with this particular um, accelerator as well. Um, there's also a variety of dashboards available. With media and communications, it includes um, entities like event and venues, sports management, ticketing, advertising, sponsorships, guest interactions, and loyalty programs. Uh, there are five sample model-driven apps included with this, as well as a sample portal and a variety of dashboards. 
I do encourage you all, if you're interested in the industry accelerators, to take a look at the links that we've provided here, but also be sure to register and join us in uh, part 11 of our series when we talk more about these industry accelerators. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to uh, Chris now, who's going to talk a little bit more about Power Automate. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, folks. I'm Chris Garrity, a program manager on the Power Automate team, focusing on if and if scenarios, specifically workflow and alerts within finance and operations. So Power Automate is the low-code, no-code solution that enables you to build workflows between your favorite apps. Power Automate leverages over 300 connectors to provide event-based triggers that can start those flows and actions that can be called from those flows. In addition, Power Automate flows can be started manually on request, started at a, cer at a certain time, or started on a recurring schedule. Power Automate has a growing selection of templates as well that can provide an easy starting point for building common flows, and there's templates for a number of the scenarios that I talk about here. Finance and Operations has a connector that currently provides the business events trigger and seven actions. The, also, once you have CDS virtual entities enabled, you can leverage the native CDS current environment connector uh, to interact with Finance and Operations. Uh, and we're actively working on making all of the capabilities from Finance and Operations available via that uh, CDS native connector. So our first scenario is the most popular for Power Autom Automate usage within Finance and Operations, with uh, Finance and Operations. You can use Power Automate to handle the approval of a Finance and Operations workflow. In the example shown here, you can see an example of using Power Automate for the approval of a purchase requisition. In this example, the flow is triggered by the creation of a work item for the purchase requisition approval workflow. And then the flow sends a Power Automate approval to the assigned user. So one key benefit of using this feature is to allow users to approve directly from their email without opening the Finance and Operations application. This was a highly requested uh, capability, and it's similar to the old Azure Service Bus feature that was available in AX 2012 that allowed users to click uh, approve from within an email. You can also use that flow to perform a variety, variety of additional actions outside of the system using the 300 plus connectors. Um, these uh, actions could include sending the approval to Teams or, send, or notifying someone via text message that an approval is needed. The flow built for the scenario is triggered by the work item create a business event and uses the execute action action on the finance and operations connector to call uh, OData actions to validate and complete the work items in finance and operations. There is a template for completing workflow work items that you can search for, and I strongly suggest you use that to get started. Uh, the links at the bottom of the slide provide more information about enabling this scenario. So Power Automate flows can also be triggered by the business event associated with alert rules. Uh, you need to make sure that your alert is marked as send externally so that the alert triggers the event and then use the associated template to get started would be a really good starting point. Um, you need to remember that there's some uh, limitation as to where you can create alerts. Um, you can only create alerts for the primary data source on a page. Um, so in this example, when a vendor is created, we're requesting a, a W4 from a vendor, attaching that file and finance and operations, and then updating some related SharePoint metadata. Uh, in this next example, you can enable the flow to be manually triggered. So these instant flows are very useful for repetitive tasks where you can't create an alert rule um, or there isn't a business event associated with it. So for now, you need to use you need to use it to manually click a workflow button in the Power Automate app, um, and you can share the flow with them so that they can do that. We're also working on a new feature that will that will add a Power Automate menu button into the Finance and Operations forms, and that will list instant flows related to the current record you're on, so that you can quickly and e easily execute instant flows directly from within Finance and Operations. 
Thanks, Chris. So taking a look at some more examples of how you might use Power Automate. In this example, we're going to primarily look at inbound flows. So here we have a few examples where you can use Power Automate to make things happen that are coming into finance and operation. In other words, the trigger that starts this Power Automate flow is happening outside of FNO by using one of the 300 plus connectors that we have available. So um, I've kind of split this out into the basic CRUD operations for create, read, update, and delete. Although I haven't put in a specific example in here for deletion, it is um, a possibility that you can do delete actions as well. So we've identified a few key scenarios by industry. So looking at the first scenario with retail schedule so software. In this particular example, we're assuming that we're using some sort of third party retail software that sits outside of finance and operations. So someone um, in the retail store is going to create a schedule for um, you know, that particular store of when the, the workers need to come in. And as a part of that process, the retail workers and shifts are retrieved from finance and operations and provided into this third party application. And then after it's completed, an approval process um, could be uh, um, spun off it using Power Automate um, to, to capture that approval. Um, it's important to note that when you're using the get a record, you can use Power Automate to query records in any of your public entities. So um, one of the things that you'll want to consider is using OData filters, sorting, and other query actions on the specific um, uh, flow task inside of your Power Automate flow so that you're not retrieving all of the records. In the second scenario, uh, we're using a manufacturing lab test result. So in a manufacturing scenario, again, maybe I'm using an external lab management system and the test results are actually recorded in that system. It might be automated or maybe manual with some user interaction involved um, in that lab management system. There may even be some IoT devices that are capturing uh, data like temperature readings, for example. Um, so we're assuming in this example that uh, there are related quality orders that exist inside of FNO and as those test results are recorded in that external lab management system, we want to reach out and uh, update those related quality orders with the test results. And then those quality orders could be validated inside of finance and operations and the inventory blocking could be released. In the third example, we have a service um, industry example. So with this one, we're um, indicating that a service contract is one. Again, we might be using some sort of external system and it could even be a manual process where contracts are created, maybe in a SharePoint site, for example. And when that status is updated in SharePoint or some other system to indicate that the contract is one, we need to create a new project inside of finance and operations. Uh, simultaneously, we might also want to email the project team about the new project. So when you're updating or creating records, it's important to note that you can access any of those public entities and you'll also have access to the OData actions on those entities, which is actually our next scenario and use case that we're going to talk about. Um, so in this particular example is that we can use Power Automate to trigger OData actions by using the execute action. You can see that um, option highlighted here on the left screenshot for execute action. Um, there are a variety of OData actions available on entities out of the box. Um, these actions are actually required and used as part of the workflow process that Chris talked about in the first example. In the example that I'm showing here, I'm showing an example where we are using uh, an OData action that is designed to approve a bill of material. So uh, we might be executing this action um, after some sort of approval process or email has happened outside of the system in previous or even later steps as a part of this, and we want to update and approve that bill of material in the system.
basically when you think about an OData action, it's a method that is on the OData entity and you have the ability to extend existing entities or create brand new entities with these OData actions. The key there is that you'll want to decorate those methods with the sys OData action attribute. You can see an example of a very simple one here um, and where the comment uh, says do something in the picture, that's where you would write your code that does whatever the action is that you want uh, to perform in the system automatically. Um, it's important to note that custom OData actions can optionally take parameters as well. So the basic process is outlined here. You'll create a flow and, and add a step and you could add multiple steps before you get there, but you'll need to search for the Dynamics 365 Fin and Ops connector. Um, then you'll select the execute option, which is what you see in the left hand screenshot, and then you'll need to select the instance from your drop down box. This is where you're choosing like your dev test or production environment, for example. The next thing is the drop down box of the action, and that's where you'll see the full list of all of the OData actions that are available in the system. The additional attributes that you see here are going to be specific to the OData action that you're calling. So in my example, this bill of material approval example has company, the bomb ID, and it also wants you to pass in the personnel number of the person who is approving this particular, um, you know, action. So another way that we can use Power Automate is to create custom business events. There are a variety of business events that are not specific to um, workflows or alerts that are already available out of the box, but you also have the ability to extend the system and create your own custom business events. The first two examples that we looked at again for workflow and alerts were also examples. There's a set of um, these, like I said, that are provided out of the box and a few examples of how we might make custom ones include automating production processes, month end or procurement. So when we take a closer look at the production processes, I might make a business event when a production order is started, finished or when a bomb is approved, just as a few examples. If I'm trying to automate my month end processes, I might create a business event that's triggered when a period is closed, when a task is completed or created inside of the financial period closed workspace, or when a consolidation is performed or when a journal is posted. There are many ways that I could use these business events to trigger events um, and be the, the starting point of my own Power Automate flow. With procurement, the three examples that are shown here, these are actually three examples that are included out of the box um, when a purchase requisition is approved, when a purchase order is received, and when a vendor invoice is posted. Um, so uh, the links that we have down here um, will show you a variety of additional examples and use cases for business events, and I encourage you to check those out. Again, like I said, we have a new um, business event feature on the roadmap for the common data service, which will expose the FNO business events and um, virtual entity data changes via the native common data service current environment connector. Um, if you're interested in joining the private preview for those, um, you can uh, join the Insider program and there's some links at the end of the, the deck um, to help you get started on that journey. Next up are uh, some scheduled flows. So scheduled flows, you can think of these um, as very similar to like a batch job. So in um, FNO, if we have custom logic that needs to execute on a specified interval, maybe daily or nightly or weekly, um, we oftentimes will create custom X++ classes that extend the batch framework and allow us to schedule those jobs. Another way that you could consider um, you know, approaching those requirements is by using a scheduled flow. A scheduled flow allows you to set up and define a schedule of the frequency that you want something to happen, whether that be once a day, uh, at a certain time of day, or hourly, or every so many minutes. You can also specify that it should always occur on the 28th of the month, um, or you can specify that they should happen after a certain number of days, hours, or minutes. 
Um, so a couple of examples of how you might use this. So um, another example here related to quality. So let's say I want to automate some quality processes. Let's say twice a day, I want to create new quality order tests based on some data that I have in my FNO environment. Uh, or maybe every hour, I want to update the quality order statuses with some information or data from another system. Um, if you're trying to automate your month end processes, I might copy month end tasks to a team site or to a planner, for example, on a specific day of the month. We might also automatically perform actions at a specific date and time. So for example, if I wanted to automatically close the period or automatically post a particular journal like a payroll entry, I could tell the system on a certain date and a certain time to go get the data needed and perform an OData action or insert records into FNO. We also have the ability to process a list of items. So um, in the example shown here, right, I could check um, some credit limits um, at a certain frequency and maybe include uh, customers who are exceeding their credit limits in an email or in a specific report, or maybe post an adaptive card into a team site. Um, we could also check the status of journals once per week. So checking to see, you know, are the journals being posted on a timely basis? Or if you're using the time and attendance functionality or project timesheets, we might check to make sure that the employees have posted their timesheet at the end of the day. And if they haven't, email them a reminder. Or maybe I just want to email them a reminder, um, you know, about an hour before the end of the day so that they don't forget to do it. Uh, so lots of great examples where we can use those. Up next, we have UI flow use cases. So UI flow or user interface flow, um, sometimes they might be referred to as RPA or robotic process automation, um, are most useful when you need to connect to a system that does not already have a connector. You can also use them for inbound scenarios in FNO where there's not a data entity, for example, but you'll need to use extreme caution and consider security as the UI flow will run and impersonate the user and um, you may also run into issues if you try to run an inbound flow to FNO as an unattended flow. It's important to note that in order to run a UI flow, you will need to install an on-premise gateway that communicates back and forth with the, uh, with the computer where the flow runs and the cloud. So the three examples that I've pulled together here um, when a quality order is generated, create a lab test in an external lab management system. So in this case, we're assuming that there is no connector. Maybe it's a cloud-based system, um, or maybe it's a, a legacy um, on-premise solution, and there is no connector to get to, to that. So we can record the steps and the clicks and pass in the data that needs to be um, input into those various fields in that system to uh, create those records. Uh, when a voucher is posted, we could post that in another ERP system. Um, with recruiting system hires, let's say um, you've hired a worker from a referral and now I need to go and create a worker and a referral bonus. Um, and maybe part of that is inside of FNO and maybe part of that lives outside. Um, there's a lot of possibilities and flexibility. It's important to note that um, you know, it's not an appropriate use of um, Power Automate um, for really high volume transaction scenarios. Just like we don't suggest using OData uh, for large volume integrations, um, the scenarios that we've presented today are also not a good fit for large volume scenarios. So you'll need to consider the size and type and frequency of data that we'll be passing through. Again, we have a variety of links available here to help you get started. Now we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about Power Apps. There are three key types of Power Apps that we're going to be talking about. Canvas Apps, which are those low-code, no-code, drag-and-drop approach to app development. Model-driven apps, which are more component-focused. And the Power Apps portals, which again are a low-code, no-code approach, but for these we're building external websites um, to surface out to users that are external to your organization. So starting off with a few Canvas app use cases and examples. So in um, this particular slide, we've kind of broken it down into three key ways that you can embed or launch a Power App 
from the finance and operations applications. So the first example is by embedding into a workspace. So for this example, let's say I'm using uh, Dynamics 365 Human Resources. I could create a Canvas app for an employee referral program and embed that right into the employee self-service workspace. Um, if um, you're, you've got a complex process for onboarding new customers and, and doing credit applications with your salespeople, this could be another great example where they're out in the field and using a Canvas app on their phone or on a tablet, gathering information about these new customers, and then going through a review and approval process. Um, and that app may be embedded as well inside of the um, finance and operations um, workspace. Another great example is quality order test results. So we talked a little bit when we were talking about the common data service where maybe the user interface needs to be more simplified and it needs to be easier to enter those test results. So you could create a new Canvas app that makes the entering those quality order test results very quick and easy and those results are then um, put back and updated into the quality orders inside of FNO. Um, another way that you can embed um, a Power App or, or a Canvas App into finance and operations is to put it directly into a Fast Tab. Oftentimes, if you're going to put it on a Fast Tab, you're going to do it on a specific page. So, um, for example, if I wanted to show MES information for a production order, um, I would want to embed that app directly on the production order details page and show them the FNO production order information along with some additional information about uh, the MES system. Another example is showing contract information for a project directly on a project um, or showing telephony information on the customer service dashboard. It's important to note that oftentimes when you're using this embedding into a fast tab that you'll want to pass a piece of data. We do support the ability to pass one piece of data from the record that you have selected in a Power App or sorry, in FNO to the Power App um, when you're embedding those. Um, another way is that we can launch a Canvas app from the Power Apps button, which you'll find in the upper right hand corner. So um, these are for scenarios where um, I want to open a dialogue or something like that um, and maybe create an IT help desk or case management app. Um, you might also use it for employee or project feedback um, or maybe as a way for sales reps to cap capture additional information um, you know, about a particular uh, customer. Um, another kind of honorable mention scenario that's not on the slide here is that you do have the ability as well to extend and create a button on any form to launch a Power App or to um, extend a page and add a Power App's host control if you wanted to embed a Power App somewhere else. You can actually see in the screenshot on the right this new product setup kind of pane that you see here is actually a Canvas app that has been embedded into a workspace uh, by using a Power Apps host control. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to uh, Jason, who's going to talk a little bit more about some more Power Apps examples. All right, thanks, Rachel. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Jason Green. I'm a uh, senior program manager on the Power Apps team. Uh, my focus is more on the FNO web client. Um, but I also cover embedding Power Apps. Uh, so I'm going to start today by showing you a few examples of, of Canvas apps and how you can use those to extend uh, the, the application. So this first example uh, came from a, a customer. What they wanted to do was be able to create a product on the fly as a sales order or a quote was being created, um, which, which isn't something that we can do that we offer out of the box. Uh, so what we did was we created a Canvas app and we added it to a few forms. So it went on the sales order form, the sales quote form. Um, it utilized that Power App button that Rachel just mentioned so that the Power App opened in a slider dialog. And so what this Canvas app does is it allows the user to type in a product and it will look it up through an external database. Uh, this could be a vendor catalog. Um, in this case, it's a UPC database. And then once that information is retrieved, uh, the app uses, it kicks off a Power Automate uh, flow that goes through the standard data entities to create and configure the product um, on the FNO side. And so within about 10 seconds after that product has been uh, uh, configured through the uh, 
the Power App, it's available for the user to use on the FNO side. So whereas this is normally something that we'd have to spend a lot of time doing coding in X++ and go through that full application uh, lifecycle to get this deployed, uh, we were able to quickly extend and overlay the experience directly into finance and operations. Um, and so for the purposes of today's conversation, this is just really, this is a really easy example of showing you how you can quickly extend the system. Uh, for the next example, uh, Rachel, if you could go to the Sorry, next slide. It's not advancing. Try this button. There we go. There we go. Uh, so this next example is a little more involved, um, and it actually uses a number of components that some of which we haven't even talked about. So this is around invoice automation. So first, what's going to happen is we're going to use Power Automate to grab an invoice that's coming in via email. Um, and so that email gets stored in CDS for storage. Uh, then we're going to use AI Builder on top of that to reason over this invoice and try to figure out what it contains, so who the customer is, what they're ordering, all that kind of stuff. Um, all this work is being done in the background. And so then where the, where the Canvas app comes in is that uh, we're going to show, we're going to surface uh, the invoice itself, and we're actually going to do all the pre-processing, grab the information that came out of that AI, push that information into specific fields, um, and then push that back into finance and operations. And so as you can see in the, in the demo, uh, we've embedded this app first as a full page app that can be accessed from the dashboard. So you can do this with the uh, full page apps uh, feature that's in preview that's built on top of saved views. Uh, you can also uh, embed this as a, as a separate tab inside of the vendor payments workspace in the finance area of dynamics. And so you'll know that we've also tried to style this Canvas app so that it looks pretty similar to the rest of the application, um, which is kind of nice. You get kind of a native experience. Uh, this example, you know, which uses several different components in the Power Platform, only took, you know, maybe a few hours to build. Um, you can actually download this example today on AppSource. And then once you've done that, all you'll have to do is create your, your invoice AI models. Um, and then again, the nice thing here is that you don't have to go and build this kind of experience directly into a workspace or as a new form in X++. You can be a little bit more agile and tweaking and maintaining this experience uh, with power users through citizen developers just using that low code, no code development style. All right, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and switch from model driven or from Canvas apps into a different type of Power App uh, that you can create called model driven apps. So these apps are a little bit different. They don't have that pixel perfect placement of components like you get with Canvas apps. They're more built based on metadata um, and they're kind of process driven. And so with these apps, you'll utilize the same platform, the same tools that you use to develop within the custom or the customer engagement application. So things like sales, marketing, field service. So these apps are usually more standalone apps, uh, but you actually can embed these into FNO using the uh, that third party uh, embed third party apps feature that's currently in preview. You can also, if you want, you could extend FNO directly to put buttons or links in FNO that will pop, that will open up these apps in a new window or tab. So one uh, kind of important distinction that's currently available in model-driven apps that you can't do in FNO uh, easily is that uh, model-driven apps have the business flow control. So what this does is it, um, it allows you to kind of define the stages a record needs to go through during its life cycle. So some examples uh, just for use cases for model-driven apps would be uh, custom ordering, um, inspections, self-service items, um, expect inspections themselves could be useful again because the ability to define those stages as you move through the inspection through completion you can surface different kinds of fields or attributes that need to be recorded and then you can use that to update information back in uh, a finance or supply chain or any other um, FNO application. Other examples could be uh, you want to introduce a new product and that product needs to go through several different phases uh, before we actually want to put it in the supply chain system itself um, or, you know, a project contract app or even vendor onboarding. So really any process where you have distinct stages within a process might be applicable for a model driven app. Uh, the other thing you can use model driven apps for is, is just for surfacing information. So like production or shop floor information. Um, 
And then again, because we have virtual entities that allow us to get to the vast majority of entities on the FNO side through the CDS, uh, you can you can use that information to create dashboards uh, that are uh, for people to consume. And then the last, if you move on one more. Did I go too far? Nope, you're good. Okay. Uh, so the last area that we're going to look at within Power Apps is portals. So this is yet another variant of Power Apps uh, that with the benefit here being the ability to create an outward facing web interface uh, for people who are external to your organization. So for example, for customers or for uh, vendor management. Um, so when you create a portal, you get to decide to surface only the data you want to expose from the CDS and that could be or. Um, from FinOps via uh, the virtual entities. Uh, you would gather information from users from that site, and then based on what they enter in the portal, you can push that back into finance and, finance and operations applications. So one great example of this is the customer portal that's available now within supply chain. Um, so even though we can't really give customers access to our Dynamics 365 applications, we can give them access to a portal that surfaces the information we want them to see and kind of solicits information from them that we need. Uh, the vendor application portal is another good example. Uh, this allows us to have a public website that vendors can go to to fill in their key information. Once they get it, we can kind of feed that back into finance and SEM and move them through the vendor on onboarding process. And just as a sneak peek here, we are planning to show an example and build a simple vendor portal uh, in the Power Apps portal session later on in the series. Uh, the final example uh, for Power Apps is, is a little bit different. So this is more for internal fo folks. Uh, so those, especially for those who aren't normal users of FinOps. Uh, so this is different. It has a little bit different licensing, so make sure you, you uh, are aware of that. Uh, but regardless, it is an easy way to create an application for internal employees uh, to surface knowledge base items for HR um, and things like that. If you are using HR, again, you can consider embedding this kind of portal using that third party application feature um, in personalization or as a link on the employee self service page. And so one last example to walk through today, which is actually very fitting given the times we're living in today. Uh, this is essentially a, a book and appointment app or a maintain your social distance app uh, that's now available. And this is trying to address one problem that you know everyone has to deal with right now, and that is that we can't have people coming into our organization or our location at any time. Um, so this example includes uh, has examples of all three of the power apps mechanisms that we talked about. So first on the screenshot now we have a model driven app. So this is more for the administration side where you can see the time slots that are available uh, for people that want to come into your, your branch or your location. Uh, the next one is a canvas app. And so this is for the employee to see who would be coming in and to actually book time slots on behalf of users. Uh, the third one is another canvas app. So this is where you can look at the available time slots, edit them, make confirmations, you know, do all the setup. And then the fourth one is the actual power portal itself. So this is a public site that can be accessed by customers and they can use it to request their appointments. I think you can see the, the book slot link circled in red there. And so all of these things are linked through the common data service. Uh, this example also uses Power Automate to send users notifications about their appointments. And so you can see how this would be super useful uh, for maintaining social distance, for being smart about scheduling times for people to come into your, your organization. So that's a quick summary of some of the Power Apps examples we had for you today. I'll hand it over to Morali next to talk about Power Virtual Agents. Thanks, Jason. So Power Virtual Agents is a, is a um, mechanism for building conversational user interface in business application and within Microsoft. I'd like to go next into a little bit of overview. Um, Rachel, if you can go to the next slide. So it's built on top of a power platform. So uh, basically the data that you save and topics and content are all stored in the power platform on CDS. It integrates with uh, thousands of connectors using the Power Automate. So when uh, when you want to take an action on behalf of a customer uh, with a chatbot, uh, it then invokes the Power Automate and it can then connect to FNO and other uh, connectors that are available. 
and it's also built on top of pod framework. Uh, so basically, if you wanted to use it in different channels like web chat or teams or any other mechanisms, then all the channels that are available from bot framework are available to Power Virtual Agents. And in addition, it can also um, is available in a 20 plus languages. So not just English, but 20 plus machine translated languages. So the model understands uh, different languages as well. So let's look at a uh, few use cases for where Power Virtual Agents applies next. So one of the biggest use cases for Power Virtual Agents is in e-commerce space. So basically on e-commerce, when a customer wants to ch uh, chat with a retailer, uh, you can embed a chat experience from Power Virtual Agents on the retail website. And you can configure this to actually uh, launch on at specific times or specific trigger points. So for example, you don't want to expose the chat on your entire website, but you want to do it on specific pages or when the user is moving between specific pages or it can be done based on number of visits to a page as well. So imagine a user has stayed on a product page for quite a number of uh, times or has he, has he waited for some amount of time, you can do that as well. And then um, you, if you have a retailer, for example, you are based in US and you have an international visitor coming into your website, you could also uh, trigger a proactive chat based on a condition like that. Similarly, when you trigger a proactive chat, you actually want uh, the specific topic to be triggered. So Power Virtual Agents also provides an ability to uh, directly trigger specific topics so that you can actually take the user to the right uh, topic immediately. So for example, say I had uh, $400 in my cart and there's a free shipping offer available uh, with say $450. In such a case, you could actually trigger the topic for free shipping and you can then uh, provide an offer to the, the customer to add the products and uh, engage with them. Similarly, the customer's context uh, when they are logged into e-commerce, uh, the context of the customer and who they are is completely passed to Power Virtual Agents, so you don't have to prompt the user to log in again within the Power Virtual Agents. And then um, the content pack, so you could ship with content packs uh, for different retailers have different business processes. So um, with this content pack, you can customize this uh, for your business needs, and these are available as a solution pack, and you can connect with uh, headless commerce APIs or retail uh, commerce APIs using Power Automate as well. Let's look at next set of use cases. So we talked about procure to pay is one of the big uh, scenarios. So right from when an employee um, raises a requisition to all the way when the actual payment lands, there are uh, cases in procure to pay where, where the virtual agent can play a big role. So it could be a virtual agent that's facing the employee, um, helping them to find out where the their requisition is, or it could be uh, a virtual agent facing the vendors. So let's look at like these two uh, use cases a little bit more in the next slide. Um, so a lot of organizations have an employee self-service portal. Now this could be a, a self-service portal that's part of FNO, or you could have an external portal that you have built. A virtual agent can be embedded in there, and it could also be part of the Teams channel. So if you have a, a Teams channel, the, the virtual agent chatbot can be present in Teams, and it can then, uh, with the same content, be able to answer questions related to you know, HR, it could be procurement, it could be benefits, and even time and expense. So the, the, it, it can act as a single IT help desk as well. So the, the, the use cases are limitless as well. Similarly for vendors, so if you had a vendor portal built or a vendor collaboration portal, uh, you could expose a chatbot built by Power Virtual Agents. It could uh, answer queries on various topics that are related to vendors, like what are the vendor onboarding um, terms and agreements, or it could be uh, whether the goods that have been shipped by vendor have been received, or it could be questions related to invoice matching and payments as well. Let's look at a few more scenarios. Um, the next two scenarios that we're going to look at are first one is for quality management. So imagine in a, in a warehouse, uh, you had a, a, a set of workers wanting to 
uh, have a question. So those uh, quality management uh, questions can be handled by the, the Power Virtual Agent. It can invoke uh, the FNO connector or uh, CDS connector via virtual entities and be able to answer questions. Similarly, uh, on the, the customer portal that we have, which is part of the Power Virtual Agent, uh, part of the Power Apps portal, you could also uh, do this as well. Okay. Thanks so much. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about mixed reality. And while mixed reality is technically not one of the Power Platform applications, the two applications I am going to talk about, which are Dynamics 365 Remote Assist and Dynamics 365 Guides, are built on the Power Platform. So we're going to take a look first at uh, mixed reality. So um, organizations um, today are facing a lot of different challenges to help digitally empower their service technicians. Um, the complexity of the machines and systems in these organizations make it difficult to train employees on complex tasks, and it makes it difficult as well to reduce time or fix um, and maintain equipment. Um, it's oftentimes difficult as well to help keep employees safe on the job when there's uh, complex training uh, or lengthy training or updates that need to be made to large groups of uh, users in your warehouse about safety procedures and new equipment. When we think about the multiple data systems that are involved in many service organizations or manufacturing organizations, um, we need the ability to integrate relevant data into our existing workflows. So uh, by using Dynamics 365 Remote Assist, um, we have the ability to manage that data and integrate into existing workflows using holographic layout tools versus you know, current manual methods where we might be uh, drawing uh, things with CAD drawings or having manual written documentation that doesn't really give the visual learner uh, the, the, the details that they may need. Um, and the 3D model management and incorporation kind of process for a lot of organizations can be complex. And from a connectivity standpoint, um, you know, a lot of organizations are asking, do we have good connectivity? Um, oftentimes, uh, your uh, field service, you know, whether it's um, devices that are out on customer sites or maybe um, machines or devices that are in your own facilities um, might have IoT data. And if we've got the ability to connect that data and make that available through the Remote Assist app, then we can bring all of that information together and make that experience better. Um, and when we think about the changing workforce, um, you know, in today's workspace, um, you know, onboarding this new generation of employees can be a time consuming task and transferring knowledge from the aging workforce, again, can be difficult um, because they may not have the time to do it or they may not have the resources um, and documentation that's required to effectively train those employees. And by leveraging tools like remote assist, we can help redu reduce turnover of, you know, contractors or employees and help generate and create a very highly skilled labor force. So taking a look at some use cases of how I might use Dynamics 365 Remote Assist with finance and operations. So in the first example, we have a commerce example with contactless shopping and service. In this example, um, we might use Remote Assist to collaborate with store per personnel for purchasing help. This might be useful in scenarios where you're selling complex items and maybe the store personnel where you have high turnover are not as skilled or have the detailed answers to some of the questions that your customers may come up with. Um, another example is um, having the ability to collaborate with a service technician for customer service examples. So maybe a customer has called in and they're having a problem with their um, device or their piece of equipment, whatever it might be. And by uh, having that ability to use remote assist to collaborate with someone remotely who does have that knowledge and expertise, it can help create better customer service experiences. 
And the second pillar of examples, we've got internal quality and production outage type scenarios. So um, in a manufacturing or a warehouse environment, um, we may need to collaborate with remote personnel. Um, maybe the engineer who designed and installed that equipment isn't in the facility um, and, and can't be right there to help. Um, we might uh, need our safety uh, managers and officers in the warehouse to be monitoring and adjusting safety procedures. And by using remote assist, we can kind of see what's going on um, and what's happening in real time. Um, we can also use it to train those new users on the equipment um, and so that they're familiar with how to um, you know, run a particular production process or a quality process, for example. And our third pillar of examples, we um, might use this in uh, field service or asset management type organizations. So um, in, again, in this um, example, we might need to collaborate with back office personnel. Um, so I might have uh, agents that are out in the field on customer sites um, or out in a warehouse, and they need to talk with someone who's in the office who designed um, or sold a particular uh, deal. Um, we can also integrate with IoT data and devices. So if I've got data flowing in from those devices on my shop floor or out on my customer site, I can pull that data in and make that available in the Dynamics 365 Remote Assist. We can also integrate that data into existing workflows and business processes. So switching gears a little bit now to um, using asset management with Dynamics 365 Guides. Dynamics 365 Guides is another example of how I can use mixed reality and the HoloLens in order to um, uh, create experiences that are part of the production process or part of the asset maintenance process. Uh, this is actually a feature that is configured to work out of the box with finance and operations when you use the new asset management module. So when we take a look at the setup process, there are four main steps. First, you'll need to configure dual write with the common data service so that we're copying the data from finance and operations into the common data service. Then you'll need to flight the MR guides feature and enable the configuration keys that are a part of that feature. Once you've enabled those configuration keys, then you can start setting up your guides. Um, the configuration process inside of finance and operations is again a simple process. Um, you'll need to create those guides uh, by using a PC to create the, the details of that guide and then you'll use the HoloLens to place the actual holograms and if you're not familiar with what a hologram is, to simplify it a little bit for you, the holograms give you reference points on a machine or um, you know where a particular tool cabinet might be um, to help with the spatial recognition when you're actually wearing um, a, a HoloLens device. And so um, once you've created your guides and added in your holograms, then you can go into finance and operations and create a maintenance checklist template. After you've created that template, you can see here in the screenshot on the associated guides grid, this is where you'll click the add guides button in order to link the guide to that particular template or to that particular step. Once you've done this, you can start creating and processing those work orders from inside of Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations and have the ability to open the Dynamics 365 guides that are related to those particular checklists. Now this particular scenario again is available out of the box, but there are some additional scenarios where you might be able to extend finance and operations to leverage the power of Dynamics 365 guides. In the first example is a manufacturing execution guide. So in this example, there would be kind of two key extension points. You would first uh, create an extension to add a guide to the operation instructions. Um, there is an out of the box feature today that allows you to create create operation instructions that include text and pictures or even videos as an example, but you could extend the solution to allow a guide to be added to those operation instructions. Then on the actual job card device or job card terminal, you would extend the actual device or terminal page so that the guide that is linked to that particular operation is displayed so that the user can put on the HoloLens and pull up the proper 
um, guide um, and start um, processing that particular production step. In the second example, um, we could use guides to help with your quality order or your um, you know, inspection process. So in this example, um, you could add an extension that allows you to link or add a guide to a test or a test group, depending on what your business requirements are and, and how many different instructions you might need. And then you could add another extension to the actual quality order page that allows you to see the guides that are related to the test or test groups that you've selected on that particular quality order. That way, the quality a management personnel can quickly and easily open that guide again um, from the HoloLens. So switching gears to our last um, kind of scenario or, or product area that we're going to talk about today is Dynamics 365 Customer Voice, which was formerly known as Forms Pro. So um, Forms Pro uh, capabilities have been expanded in the new customer voice application to be a simple yet powerful feedback management solution. Customer voice enables you to capture customer feedback instantly and engage the right people at the right time across different channels and it allows you to leverage surveys personalized for your audience. It doesn't have to be just customers. It could be vendors, employees, or anyone um, in your organization. Um, by using these, we can accelerate the time to capture that information uh, by using the templates that are available out of the box. Customer Voice will also help you integrate your data with Dynamics 365 customer records for deeper customer insights. All of the data captured in a survey that you build is stored directly in the Common Data Service. And when data updates are made to those surveys or you create new surveys, automatically every response is stored, giving you an always on kind of measure of audience perception. In addition to Dynamics 365, Power BI, Power Automate, and Power Apps all integrate with Customer Voice to deliver a holistic connected experience. Customer Voice drives action by helping you deliver real-time feedback based on the customer feedback that you gather. And Power BI helps you visualize your feedback insights. And by using Power Automate, we can um, enable automatic response triggers. So when I get a response, I can tell the system what I want to have happen. Finally, customer voice gives you full control over your data with the ability to store your survey responses and integrated data in your own data center. So taking a look at some specific use cases that I can do with customer voice and finance and operations. So um, I've separated the examples into three pillars for collecting, analyzing, and automating business process. So when we think about collecting data, I might want to collect data or information about shipping quality or product quality. I might also want to send out a survey that gets a net promoter score from my customers after uh, they've opened a, a, a ticket or um, had a return or um, in, they've received their item. When I think about how I might want to analyze my data and the types of surveys or things that I might include in my uh, customer voice uh, feedback um, is the ability to analyze customer sentiment, review individual responses or uh, trends over uh, time on a particular survey. So when I'm analyzing trends, I might look at uh, trends of responses from different demographics or regions of users, or I might look at trends based on who their customer service agent was that helped them when they called in, for example. Um, and when we think about automating processes, there's a lot of different ways that we could automate a process. So I could notify product and shipping managers when there's a problem. So maybe someone filled out a survey and gave some negative responses and the sentiment wasn't very positive. I could tell the system to automatically notify certain people in the organization with an email or maybe I put those into a SharePoint list um, or into a Teams channel um, so that they can start to take action on that information. We also have the ability to send surveys automatically. So if I want to automatically trigger a survey to be sent when something happens in the system, I can use my business events or my common data service to be that trigger for um, when I want to send a survey. And when that trigger occurs, I can add another step into my Power Automate flow to say send this particular survey. 
Um, and because we can integrate with Power Automate, that means I, again, have all the connections to um, all you know 300 plus connectors that are available. So taking a look at some more specific examples and use cases, in this first one, we're talking about quality checks. Quality checks could mean a lot of different things depending on the type of industry or organization that you work in. So uh, if you're a retailer um, or a distributor, you might want to check for quality on the delivered services. Um, if you're a service industry type customer, you might want to validate the project performance. Were the consultants that we assigned to you or the technicians or engineers um, meeting your expectations? You might also gather feedback for an assessment that you perform. Um, or if you think about an HR example, you might want to gather feedback about how a training class was that you conducted for your employees. So when we think about how we can embed these experiences into finance and operations, you can embed a um, a, a forms pro or a customer voice survey um, as a third party web app through the personalization toolbar. Uh, you can also embed it in a model driven power app. And again, if you embed a customer voice survey into a model driven power app, that power app could then in turn be embedded using the third party personalizations. Um, you could also add a link to a workspace or extend and create custom buttons, or you could just make a mashup of survey results with FNO data um, using Power BI. So you could take your FNO data plus the CDS data with those survey results and create Power BI dashboards, which then could be embedded or pinned into finance and operations. When we think about the automation experiment experience here, I could use Power Automate to automatically send um, from a CRUD update um, or a CRUD operation that happens on a virtual entity. I could create a business event and use Power Automate to say when this happens, automatically send a survey. I could create a button extension to call custom logic, um, or I could automatically update FNO when I get the response. Another example is around employee satisfaction. So you might send out surveys to your workers, um, especially if you're using the human resources application um, to get you know, an annual pulse about the, their benefits. Are, are they happy with the benefits? Um, you know, what do they think? What's missing? What would they like to see? Uh, you could also use it as a way to um, manage self evaluations. Although human resources does have a performance review and goals feature, um, you might want employees to fill out a self evaluation that's included as a part of that process. So you could have them fill out the survey, send it to them automatically, and then put the results in a Power App, a Canvas app, for example, and embed that Canvas app directly into the reviews page um, into a Fast Tab, for example. Um, inside of human resources. Uh, you might also do like a quarterly feedback where you're checking in about uh, the manager and seeing how a uh, manager is doing or like new hire orientation, like a check in after 90 days. When you're embedding into human resources, you can embed as a third party web app through personalization. You could embed in a model driven app uh, the same way, or you can add a link to a workspace through personalization or through the human resources parameters. When you think about the automation experience, again, very similar. I might use Power Automate to perform updates on the CDS, which will then in turn update human resources, or I might create an alert rule to trigger a Power Automate flow. Uh, you can also automatically update HR directly with response data um, and mash up survey results with HR data uh, using Power BI. But keep in mind that HR currently does not have the ability to customize or pin Power BI. So those Power BI reports would live outside of uh, your human resources application, but you could absolutely add a link into a workspace um, so that users can navigate out to that Power BI dashboard. With that, we're going to go ahead and switch gears to application lifecycle management. So from an application lifecycle management standpoint, it's very important to note that, you know, we need to manage the ALM for our Power Platform components much like we would for FNO, but there are clear differences in how the application lifecycle um, you know, works for the Power Platform. So that's what we're going to dive into now. First, I want to talk a little bit about environments. 
Um, environments are containers that administrator can use to manage apps, flows, connections, and other assets. It's up to you when you create an environment whether or not you want to add a database to that environment. And if you choose to add a database, then that becomes your common data service database. Um, if you're just building some power apps and flows and you don't need a mechanism to store data, for example, if you're just going to be connecting to FNO directly or HR directly as an example, and you don't need a database, uh, you can create an environment without a database. Um, Environments, you can think of them as a scope um, for the life cycle of your project, you know, dev test prod, um, and a scope for permissions. So you might create separate environments for different purposes, like I'm building a sales app, um, and that particular environment only has access to salespeople, and the data that's in there is only specific to the data that's required for that sales app. If you're building a portal, you might make a separate environment that's specific to that portal. You'll want to carefully consider consider this um, and how many environments make sense. Um, much like FNO environments, you can also select a region where you want the environment to be deployed. Um, you can create many different environments for different purposes. Um, a CDS environment does come with your finance and operations implementation, but if you're going to deploy additional common data service database environments, it may require additional licensing. So some key facts and things to know about environments. Again, environments are tied to a geographic location that's configured at the time when you actually set up and create that environment. Um, there isn't an ability to uh, move an environment to another uh, geo or another Azure data center. So if you need to move it to a different geographic location, you can deploy a new one and use uh, different ALM tools to copy um, the database and move it and all the, the solutions and so on from one environment to another. Um, environments can also be used to target the different audiences for different purposes. So the examples again of dev test prod were the example that I just gave of like a sales app versus a portal. Um, every tenant comes with a default environment where all licensed Power Apps and Power Automate users are allowed to create apps and flows. This is the environment that's used for citizen developer scenarios. The non-default environments have greater control. And they offer more control around uh, the permissions and creation can also be restricted to only global and service admins from the Power Platform Admin Center. When you're thinking about your environments, you'll also want to define an environment strategy for the deployment of your CDS environments. Uh, much like you need to have an environment strategy for your finance and operations, you'll need to have a strategy for your CDS. Um, and that includes not just um, how many environments you have, what types of environments and so on, what geos they're going to be deployed in, but also like how each environment will be connected to other applications. So you'll wanna think about creating a diagram that indicates what those linkages are. Um, you'll want to assign your admins um, the Power Platform Service admin role, which grants full access to Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power BI. Um, and you'll want to restrict the creation of net new trial and production environment to those admins because you don't want just anyone going out there and creating new CDS environments anytime they like, especially because there's cost associated with those environments. Um, we also recommend that you treat the default environment as a personal productivity environment for your business groups. Um, we actually recommend that you rename the environment um, and give it a name such as personal productivity. Um, it's obviously not required, but it makes it more obvious like what that environment is for. Um, we also recommend that you establish a process for requesting access or the creation of new environments. Um, you might have um, or need to create new envi environments again for specific groups or specific applications, and you might have individual use um, environments that are for proofs of concepts or trainings that you might be conducting in your organization. So switching gears from environments to talk a little bit more about solutions. Solutions are used to package and maintain components that make up one or more Power Apps, Power Automate flows, and Power Virtual Agents. This includes things like portals and UI flows, as well as AI builder product projects that you create.
Um, solutions are created and authored by a publisher as well. Um, and when we think about all the components that go inside of a solution, on the right hand side, you can see that we've kind of broken it down for you to data models, user interfaces, process code, and other. These are all the different types of things that can um, be a part of a solution. Um, and it's important to note that there are two different types of solutions. We have managed solutions and unmanaged solutions. Unmanaged solutions are to be used in development environments while you're making configuration changes to your application. Solutions are exported as an unmanaged solution and then checked into your source control system. And unmanaged solutions should be considered your source. While managed solutions are used to deploy to any environment outside of your development environment. This includes your test, your UAT, your SIT, and production environments, for example. Managed solutions should be generated by a build server and considered a build artifact. So taking a look at some do's and don'ts of your solutions. It's important to note that solutions require a publisher, and the same publisher can be associated with multiple solutions. Two default publishers are included, which are the CDS default publisher and the default publisher for your organization ID. Um, so that could be like ORG and then followed by some numbers and letters that are specific to your organization. We strongly recommend that you create your own publisher and do not use one of the default publishers. The publisher dictates the customizations prefix and the option set values. Uh, we also recommend that you use the same publisher in all of your solutions, and it's important to note that when importing new assets through a managed solution, the publisher is who owns those assets. Um, you should only include the assets and sub assets that have changed or been modified, not the entire entity. Now, if you created a brand new entity from scratch, you would want to include the entire entity. But if you've only changed, um, you know, a form on an entity or a specific field or added a business process flow, we only recommend including those sub components or sub assets that you have actually modified. This will reduce the solution import time and the size and complexity of the solution that you're importing. Um, it'll also reduce the code base that's stored in your source control and it will help reduce collisions when you've got multiple developers working on assets of a component such as an entity. Um, it's also not recommended to click the add all assets button, button when adding existing entities to your solution. Again, we've provided a variety of links at the bottom to help you get started with your journey in understanding solutions and environments, and you can use these links to help you understand more about um, the um, application lifecycle management with the Power Platform. Up next, we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit more about the Power Platform build tools for Azure DevOps. For pro dev experiences, you'll want to use the Power Platform build tools for Azure DevOps. You can use the tools to automate common build and deployment tasks related to Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power Virtual Agents. This includes tasks like provisioning and deprovisioning of environments, the synchronization of a solution metadata, so in other words, solutions between your environments. Uh, so when you want to move something between development um, and your source control or another environment, environment. Um, it's also used to generate your build artifacts, deploying to downstream environments, and performing static analysis checks against your solution by using the Power Apps Checker service. On the right, you can see a screenshot of uh, the, the Power Platform build tools inside of Azure DevOps. And it's important to note that when you use finance and operations, you can um, put um, your finance and operations builds um, and the steps together into the same build um, as your Power Apps um, or Power Automate um, or Common Data Service um, build objects as well. 
Um, the basic process when we think about this um, is a four step process. You'll need to first install and then you'll want to create a build pipeline to export from dev, a build pipeline to generate your build artifact and a release pipeline to deploy to production. You'll want to consider this strategy alongside with your finance and operations to decide what the right number of builds are and how you want to name those uh, build pipelines um, so that it's easy to understand and recognize by the developers in your environment. So taking a closer look at the process flow of the application lifecycle management when we use the Power Platform build tools, you can see that it's separated into three phases. The initial build pipeline is what instantiates a pristine development environment, typically daily. Then the build pipeline is um, automated um, to help get rid of manual steps. You're still going to need to run a unit test manually, um, but there's no more need to manually upload to the solution checker and manually export, unpack, and push to the repo. With the automated release pipeline, this also helps remove some uh, manual steps. You could set this release pipeline up to publish weekly, daily, or hourly, and those releases will just automatically become the new standard. It's important to note that you'll still need to run your unit tests and integration tests um, as a part of this process. Uh, so I want to remind everyone that uh, this is the first part in a 12 part series and who knows, maybe we'll add a 13th part um, if if something comes up that's exciting, but I encourage you to get registered for the upcoming parts. In the next part, we're going to be talking about the common data service in much more detail and we will be um, conducting some demonstrations and talking more about the do's and don'ts with each one of these applications in the future uh, parts of the series. We've also got Power Automate coming up at the end of September, UI flows in October, and Power Apps Canvas Apps uh, towards the end of October. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, take a look and see what we've got for Q&A since we've got a few minutes left here at the end. Um, I see that we've had quite a few questions come in and we've been responding to those. Um, to the team, do we have any questions that um, are uh, pressing that we should try to, to answer while I scroll through here and see what we've got. Um, looks like most of these have been answered. All right. So the a question came in, what is required to enable Dynamics 365 Remote Assist? Is there somewhere to sample, uh, test how it works? Great question. So Remote Assist does require some additional licensing to be in place. And in the appendix, I can actually click forward and get to it. Um, there are some slides that we've got um, at the very end down here, which you'll get in the um, in the decks when they're available. There are some links here um, on the documentation for Remote Assist um, and for learning it. Um, and there's also a YouTube channel. Uh, but if you go to the Dynamics 365 Remote Assist page on the um, main Microsoft Docs um, page, um, one of the first pages there is the prerequisites for installing it. And that will talk through all the details that you might be looking for. Um, someone uh, asked, do you have more detailed info on how a partner can purchase the licenses for HoloLens device itself and mixed reality to use it with FNO? So there's kind of two parts to that. Um, just by purchasing a HoloLens, um, that will give you access to use a HoloLens and there's a bunch of apps that come with the HoloLens uh, by default. And to use either Dynamics 365 guides or um, Dynamics 365 remote assist, there is additional licensing that you'll need to purchase. The licensing guide for finance and operations does have some additional information uh, about how to um, purchase those and what SKUs are needed. So I encourage you to check out that licensing guide. Um, So 
So someone said, hi, I'm eager to start promoting the use of customer portal. Customers have been asking if open invoice and cus statements can be made available. Would this require virtual entities or is this entity already available in the CDS so that it is a possibility? Um, I don't know specifically, maybe um, Vasavi, I don't know if you know uh, by chance if that particular entity is in the out of the box solution, but I can say for certain you could absolutely use the virtual entities. Um, the virtual entities related to uh, invoices and customer statements do exist. Um, you know, depending on your needs, you may want to consider creating a new entity that limits the data down further, but you could also do that by creating a view in the common data service um, through the kind of model driven app experience um, by you know editing that. Well, when we do the Power Apps um, portals session, we're actually planning to show um, how to build a portal and using virtual entities and real entities in the CDS. So you'll get to see some demos of that real time when we get to that session part. So hopefully that answers the question for now. Um, a question came in, can a production finance and operations CDS environment be linked to the existing customer engagement production environment? Yes, it is possible to link your finance and operations environment to the CDS of a customer engagement environment that already exists. There is a link on the um, um, Microsoft Docs website that specifically walks through the steps of how to link to an existing CDS versus deploying a brand new one. Um, it'd be important to note that you wouldn't want to deploy a new one. You would want to instead follow the instructions to link to an existing environment. Um, so those those can be found directly on uh, the Microsoft Docs site. And I'll, I'll make sure too that we get some frequently asked questions uh, posted as well with some more specific links uh, to help answer some of these questions. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions here that I see. Does anyone else, uh, did I maybe miss any? Um, there's a couple questions in here about some of the banking accelerators. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I would encourage you to go take a look at uh, the link um, for uh, the banking accelerator, uh, but um, I'll, I'll also try to follow up and see if I can find more specific um, answers on that and get um, that put in the frequently asked questions. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it back over to Ross uh, to wrap us up today. Um, I want to thank everyone again for attending um, and taking the, the time out of your day to uh, learn about the Power Platform and extending your finance and operations applications. Thank you again. Hey, thanks, Rachel. I've posted a short link to a survey in the Q&A panel. We'd like your feedback on today's session, and we'd like to hear what you'd like to see in future events. The survey scores are on a scale from one to five, with five being the highest score possible. Thank you for, for your participation in this. As a reminder, the recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. This concludes today's broadcast. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and audience. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day or evening. Goodbye.